The Polish-Soviet War of 1919 all the way to 1921 was a war that not a lot of people talk about. <coughs> Even though it just might be one of the most important wars in modern history, excluding the Second World War that surely follows it. So, what makes this Gopnik fight between the plumbers of Europe and the vodka-loving bear so important. Well, if you truly want to see a much more detailed video going in-depth on this topic, then go watch Feature History's video on the topic. You owe me one, you fucking bastard. Well, I'll mostly cover... the alternate scenario. Alright, let's begin! Доброе утро, товарищ Троцкий. Доброе. Я не вижу, чтобы ты пришел с чаем. Лучше бы это были хорошие новости. Вот, возьмите ваше благородство. Война с Польшей? И Ленин это подписал? Когда он научился писать? А почему ты здесь? У тебя проблемы с моей бородой? Поляки приедут в Киев, чтобы сыграть в кошарку. Ублюдок! I made this skit so that you could understand in what position our poor Uncle Trotsky was in. So, as you can see, he's glistering with joyful anger. Trotsky wanted the war to happen a year or two later so that he could reorganize the army and mostly reorganize the chain of command. Mostly so that he could change Papa Stalin for another commander that would be far more obedient. Also, this is future Omesh. Uh, he also wanted to deal with the white forces in the far east of Russia. But, I mean, they were dwindling by the day, so... I mean, this really doesn't change anything. So, yeah. So, why is that he wanted to remove Stalin? Well, if you haven't watched any video about the war, then I have no other choice than to explain to you that Papa Stalin did the big oopsie. And I mean big one. He encircled the city, Lviv, Lvov, Lviv. I'm sorry, and I'm having problems saying this shit. So he encircled the city and waited for them to surrender. I guess he wanted to play catch or something. Rather than to go as planned and continue pushing the southern front that he was assigned to lead, or even help Warsaw push to end the war, he decided that a city was far more important. So the more that we talk about this, the more we see that we don't have to change much for the Soviets to win. I mean, seriously, some minor changes and boom, Poland is gone. What, what was that? So, what do we change? Well, Whatever do you want to change? You want to change when the Polish start the push into Ukraine? Boom, Soviet victory. You want to change the tactics of the Battle of Warsaw? Boom, Soviet victory. You want to change who gets to drink vodka first? Boom, Soviet... What the hell is all that noise? My birthday is like half a year away, shithead. <laughs> We're all fellow Slavs here, right? We can talk it out in a friendly game of football. Ah, pichko matter. So, the Soviets win the war, to the dislike of my Polish viewers. So, what happens next? Well, as one Soviet general once said, we moved to Berlin over the dead corpse of Poland. By the way, this isn't a Papa Stalin quote, it's from this guy, that would later on die from the Stalinist purge. But... Before they move on to Germany, they'll have to finish off the Baltics. Okay, done. Now, a lot of you may expect that the Soviets will continue, will keep on going, and will just go on until the whole world becomes a communist utopia. But here's what will stop them. 
the death of Lenin in 1924. Lenin's death will give the Soviets a very needed rest, as the army was getting tired of war, also giving the Soviets enough time to gather information and build communist support in other nations. That rhymed. I should become the new singer of Sabaton. Huh, a new career choice. The Allies are shitting themselves. No, seriously, they're in such a panic that they are fully on a witch hunt for communist support in their nations. Mostly in the UK, France, and the US. Surprising, I know. The Allies are boring, let's go back to the Soviets for fuck's sakes. Now, who will lead the Soviets in the next upcoming years after Lenin's death? Papa Stalin or Uncle Trotsky? To be honest, both of these scenarios are great video ideas in their own, so I'll be saving them for the next few parts of this three-part scenario. I'm not lazy, I swear, I just want to make three enjoyable videos. So for the remaining of this video, I'll just be adding extra mini scenarios that didn't make it to the main scenario, because of them being either too unrealistic, or just make the Soviet Union way too OP, which I'm notorious for doing. Fun scenario number one, a mini Iron Curtain. The Hungarians were in a war with Romania, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia. If they would have held on until 1920, or at most 1921, they would have called the Soviets for aid. If the Soviets are successful with conquering the alliance of Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, Romanoslavia, then this would in turn create a mini Iron Curtain. Fun scenario number two. The German Civil War. There would have been a German civil war if the Soviets went all in and raced to take Berlin in 1921 and 1922, as there was a huge level of communist support in Bavaria. If they do succeed, this will create a huge ally for the Soviet Union. Why is Operation Barbarossa playing when the Soviets are the one invading Germany? Fun scenario number three, Turkish SSR. If the Soviets feel cocky, they could have interrupted the Greco-Turkish War, potentially adding an extra SSR or two to the USSR. To quote Daddy Z when he was talking about the communist Turkey and Greece. Oh my god, this is the best thing to happen, it's really not weird whatsoever, it's, it's really interesting. Fun scenario number four. North and South Iran. This connects to the Turkish one where the Soviets technically could get involved in the division of the Ottoman Empire and the Middle East. That's it, I can't add anything more to this one. Share the video, subscribe and leave a like. Next video will go in depth on the Stalin's focus tree. And on the video afterwards we'll go on to Trotsky's. See you in part two and three. Omesh, du hast zwei weitere Videos versprochen, du Haufen Dreck. Ah, Pichko, Matesh. Ich muss ihn, dass er von uns am Kopf da nicht am Rekord hat. Dann wirst du aber Lenten verlieren. Epa, da, Omesh, Papa. Also willst du, dass ich dir... Warte, wie verstehen wir uns eigentlich? Epa, ja, es ist schon von uns, wo wir... Welcome back, you history-loving weasels! I'm back after what seems like an eternity in YouTube standards. Oh well, it's not like anybody gave a shit. <clears throat> anyway, without wasting any more of your time, let's begin this communist adventure that should have uploaded five fucking months ago. The year is 1925. 
an atmosphere of dread surrounds the Soviet Union. Now it's either that, or it's the sweet smell of carbon coming out of the factories! Ha ha ha! Do you feel it, comrade? Do you feel the impending doom of the imperialist scum approaching by every hit of a Soviet hammer? Uh, <clears throat> I should calm down before somebody suspects me of being a communist sympathizer. Anywho, Stalin took power in the Soviet Union, just like how he did in our timeline. So, bang bang, boom boom, gulag gulag. So what happens after this? Well, imagine what Stalin did with half of Ukraine, one third of Belarus and, you know, Western Russia. Yeah, imagine that, but with half of Eastern Europe. Poland is basically another toy that Stalin will use for his game of who is the biggest dickhead in history. Now, before we go on to talk about how the Soviets will beat the ever so living shit out of the Allies... What, did you expect me to make a Russia lose type of video? Oh, I'm far too delusional to make something like that happen in my videos. <clears throat> Let's talk about the Soviet Union's interior. And by that, I mean let's talk about the huge mess that is also known as the SSRs of the USSR. Just like a dysfunctional family, the Soviet Union stayed together mostly out of the false pretense of having autonomy among the SSRs. Yeah, I know, it's the funniest joke since Amy Schumer fell in front of Kanye and Kim Kardashian, haha. -ha. So, nothing really changes inside the USSR. Other than... the map looking a bit funkier than usual. Actually, come to think of it, how will the Polish view all of this? Just imagine how two Polish generals will just interact with one another while the Soviets just invade. Ah, oh, da, we finally are free from the Austrians, Germans, and Russians. Hooray for Poland! Um, the Soviets are coming. The what? Well, at least we're under one overlord this time. A kurva! Now, let's take a look of all the nations inside the USSR. <laughs> Fuck that, I ain't reading any of those. Well, regardless, we would see one of the biggest factory booms in all of history. With Western Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and Poland having a massive industry. The five-year plan could basically be dwarfed and could be considered the 20 fucking year plan. Because adding an extra 30 million into the population would catapult you to the next level of superpower. Now, the Soviet Union does what the Soviet Union does best. And that is starving itself, killing millions of its own kind without flinching, and looking at the world, flipping them the biggest of birds. And also spreading communism. Now, we all know who will be the Soviets' first target. <laughs> Don't worry, Germany. Everybody needs a bit of red in their lives. You just need a little bit more. In all honesty, having a massive communist power next to Germany's borders would make the Allies very worried about the future. So, logic pray tell, they will aid the Germans and help the economical problem or even lift a lot of the debt that they have imposed on Germany. Oh, would you look at that, the Great Depression, the world's economy is on fire. Gee, if only there is a way to make all our money issues go away. Now, the funny thing about the Great Depression, other than it's a perfect analogy for many edgy teenagers' lives, is that the only countries that were not affected by it were basically the Asia countries 
and the new countries of Eastern Europe. So Poland, Finland, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, Romania, Hungary, and the USSR. As you can see, the main two, Poland and the USSR, are technically one country. They would be hit by the depression the least. That's because their economy wasn't dependent on the Americans, British or French. That's why Germany, Spain and Italy would be the biggest targets for the commies. Stalin would most likely be focused on Germany, Spain and Italy aren't as important for the time being. Besides, uh, Italy saw the rise of Mussolini and Spain would eventually have a civil war, while France has a growing number of communist sympathizers. How would the upcoming years be dictated? Well, in a span of five years we would see the fall of Germany to communism, the invasion of Finland, the rise of communist support in Romania, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, and Turkey. This might just lead to Austria pulling a Switzerland and staying neutral for the upcoming battle royale that will take place in this world. Oh shit, I forgot, there's more to history than Europe and America. Ah, let's be honest, we're the most understandable part of history. I mean, Look at this! Do you think this could be explained in a 10 minute long video? Ahem. So, I'll try to explain what would happen in Eastern Asia? So... Nah, fuck this. Jesus. And I was here thinking that being in a long distance relationship is gonna be stressful. I mean, just imagine being an East Asian historian. Oh god, imagine being a North Korean historian. I mean, what do you do? Just burn factual history and just conjure up an epic about your great leaders? Oh, what's this logo? What's this logo in the back of my chair? Oh, thank you for asking everybody. This is the logo of my Instagram page called at History Blend. Go give it a follow. I would probably post more often than on, on my own YouTube channel. Anyways, back to the video. Alright, so because Asia in of itself is a mess that no one should dare to venture in without a proper guide, and because I'm uneducated, I'll be simplifying a lot of things. So if I missed a detail or said something wrong, Bite my ass, kiss my dick, call me Papa Jones. Uh -huh. So as the Chinese Civil War is still going on, we see the invasion of Xinjiang by the Soviets and the installation of a pro-Soviet government, just like in our timeline. Predicting what the Japanese would do in this situation is hard, as the Soviets might just as well start a conflict with them as soon as they got the chance. From a border conflict or a fabricated incident in of itself. Just like that. Right, so other than that, I honestly can't talk about anything else before I start to overcomplicate shit. A lot of you would say, but this is the bare minimum, and to that I say, dude, the bare minimum is the ideology of my fucking nation. Now, back to the part of the world that kinda makes sense-ish, maybe? Around 1935, Europe would be under a lot of pressure from the Soviets. On one side, the Allies will not let another nation fall under them, while on the other, they're scared shitless knowing that the Germans are going to aid the Russians in this war, but would still put their foot down if they see any form of Soviet expansion. World War II would happen, regardless. It's only a matter of when. Now, who wins is all up to my imagination, cause let's be honest, no one can predict what could happen in an alternate timeline. 
But that isn't gonna stop me from trying. The Japanese invade China, together with the Soviet Union and the North. The League of Nations stands their ground, and they declare war on the Soviets and the Japanese. The US joins this war far earlier, as Japan feels a lot more confident with invading the Philippines. The Soviets invade Czechoslovakia and Romania, and are at the borders of Hungary and Bulgaria. The Soviets slowly invade China, taking the center with the Communist Chinese, while the Japanese are more concentrated on the coastal. While in Europe, the Soviets offer the North Carpathian Mountains to the Hungarians, which they agree on, but with the condition to join the Soviets in their efforts in Europe. After the Soviet and German army break into France and reach Paris, the Italians join the war on the Allied side, seeing the threat of the Soviets and Germans working together. The Soviets continue on pushing into southern France. Then the Soviets open a new front in the Middle East to cover their oil fields in the Caucasus and also trying to starve the Allies from their own oil. In the Asian front, the Japanese and Soviets divide China. Back in Europe, the Soviet and German advance stops in the Alps. While in the Middle East, the Soviets divide into two fronts the west and the east, the western front going all the way to the Suez Canal, while the eastern front going all the way to India's border. The Soviets and Japanese destroy all Chinese resistance, and Japan lands in Indonesia and Malaysia as they continue pushing down, threatening North Australia. Siam joins the Japanese, letting them pass through and help invade India. The Soviets break through the stalemate in the Alps and kick the Allies out of Europe. The Soviets continue to invade India while the Suez still holds. Japan fails their invasion of Australia. The Americans come and sweep the Japanese off the islands, one by one. Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, Austria, and Greece join the Soviets, or they get invaded. Turkey is invaded by the Soviets. So the Soviets do what the Soviets do. And they pop in the fuck ton of nations in the Middle East. America drops the first nuke in Tokyo. America drops another nuke in Yokohama, which is basically near Tokyo. That's because they landed on the island of Hachijo. The Soviets break the stalemate in the Suez and invade North Africa, while India totally falls to the communist and Japanese forces. The Germans built the nuke. Papa Stalin gives his blessings, and the Soviets send it on a one way flight straight for London. Just like a couple of coronavirus pa- With no clear winner, the leaders of Germany, the Soviet Union, and Japan agreed to meet with the Allies in Cairo to divide the world. And after 12 years of war, and after countless of deaths, mostly Chinese and Soviets, the world is in a pseudo-peace for the time being, until Papa Stalin gets bored. Well, that about wraps it up for this scenario. The world is divided, again, Soviets controlling most of the world this time. The perfect Amish video. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. After
Do you know fellow comrade enter the Kremlin? Yet, Suka, your only needed when war is upon us. We have no need for Mensheviks in our political system. Suka, you're only jealous of my revolutionary style. Maybe if you stop starving the population, Bliet, they might start liking you. Oh, better yet, Lenin would stop rolling over his grave when you quit stealing the five-year plans that I made. Suka. I planned a merciful death for him. Welcome back, you history-loving we. Hmm. I got a strange feeling of deja vu. Oh well, time for the finale. The end game to my three-part series that should have concluded before 2019 ended, but hey, now I can blame it to the coronavirus for my laziness. Now, you have already watched the first two parts, so you know who's coming up next. That's right, Uncle Trotsky is here, baby. So what does this other glorious mustache and bearded man bring to the table? Does he bring more communism, conquer more of the world, or does he bring more dank maymays? Short answer, yes. After the fall of Poland and the death of Lenin, Trotsky would obviously be the first in line to inherit the throne. That sounds very wrong. What does Trotsky do that tells him apart from Papa Stalin? Well, surprisingly not that much. The starvation of Ukraine and the forced industrialization of the USSR is still happening. The five-year plans still happen because they were originally Trotsky's idea that Stalin took. Remember, this is gonna be a reoccurring thing. Oh, and also, political dissidents will still be sent to the gulags of Siberia. What about the division of the Soviet Union? Would it be less centralized? Stalin forced centralization onto the Union like the whole communism in one state thing. Even if the Soviet Union would have been run by Trotsky, we would see the same division of the Union into smaller SSRs. If not, we would see even more SSRs, but with the Russian Federation part being in charge of the other SSRs. How many times did I say that word? With Poland's territories going to the SSRs of Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania, and the new SSRs in the Carpathians, so that the Hungarian communists have a place they could turn to, the ridiculous borders of the stands would not have happened due to the fact that Trotsky isn't into the divide and conquer strategy that Stalin was into. So borders are changed to fit the demographics of the SSRs, basically balkanizing the region to fit its ethnicities. Oh wow, the borders look like absolute fucking shit. Trotsky was more of a general of an army, and politics wasn't his strongest forte. Well, neither was for Stalin, but hey, no one's perfect. So, he would assign more fitting leaders to the SSRs to rule over domestic needs, while he would run the state as a military leader. Now, that doesn't mean that he would be laid back on everything far from that. He would still be on top, but with others having more impact. But if he sees any disturbance, he would smite down with the power of Lenin. Being in control now allows him to continue his simp quest of making the world communist. Oh wait, most people don't know this. So anyways, fun fact, this dude turned communist so that he could get into a girl's panties. And after getting into her, he thought to himself, <clears throat> Why should I work for a woman when I can work for the state and get all the women? <clears throat> So then he joins the Mensheviks, seeing the Bolsheviks as too revolutionary. Honestly, if this man has this much audacity to call them too revolutionary, then I have more than enough nuts to call my dad lazy for not cleaning his fucking dishes. Not that I clean them. So people would like to say that he would be a war-hungry madman and would go on and just like declare war on everyone. That won't really be the case. You see, this isn't Hoi 4, and people change over time. 
Also, Asia exists, so no one can predict how Trotsky can rule the Union. So, is this a, the conclusion of the video? Does this stop rational thinking men to proceed knowing that no matter what he says, it's gonna be unrealistic, doubtful, hated, or worse, disliked and forced to read a novel's worth of hate comments? <laughs> that isn't gonna stop me from making the SSROP again. Ho <laughs> ho! Anyways, one more thing I need to add. Alcohol in the Soviet Union, kinda legal for a short bit? No, seriously, you can Google that. Okay, now for the juicy bits. Start with the sexual transitions. The reaction of most of Europe is out of fear. The fall of Poland and the Baltics would be seen as a failure to the Allies, but not that they can do anything about it. They fought th them for almost a decade and the people don't want another war, so for now they would stay and watch. The Balkans point of view are mixed. Like the ethnicities. Oh ne, ja sam čist Srbin, ne može taka da mi pričaš. Listen here, fat ass that I took as an example because everyone else here is the fucking same. We all fucked each other, literally. No amount of Burek is gonna lessen the Albanian in me and no amount of Kosovo is gonna fulfill your empty heart. <clears throat> so the Romanians would try to make an alliance with the Turks, Czechoslovakians and the Yugoslavians to defend themselves against the Soviet Union. Greece would contribute to some degree but would hold mixed views on them. Yugoslavia is also a wild card, as the Serbians uh, view the Russians as an ally. Bulgaria, on the other hand, might try to strike a deal with the Soviets if they ever try to expand southwards, to reclaim some lost territories, if not more. Ah, the non-Russian Russians of Europe. The Swedish, Norwegian, and Finnish governments would try to keep the borders they have intact. The most likely to be targeted is Finland, as it used to be a former Russian land. Would they band together and protect their new formed ally? Hell no. They knew if they did that, that would provoke the Soviets. Well, mostly Trotsky. So, they say their farewells to Finland as nicely as they can. The US's views of the collapse of Poland and the Baltic nations is a disaster and a setback from the achievements of the Great War. They wanted to set rules and borders out of ethnic lines and lessen conflict and reduce tension and would blame the Soviets for any disturbances that happened inside of your- Oh shit, the stock market just fucking crashed. Quick, hide your burgers under your third chin before the socialists take it away from you. Why did I force myself to go to this fucking place? Any YouTuber that mostly focuses on Europe and goes to Asia and acts like they know everything are just crying out, my dick is small while the women I fuck are large. How would the whole conflict in Asia go down? Well, it's probably just gonna be, is Trotsky gonna get the hard on by fucking Japan? Short answer, yes. Long answer... <laughs> now, compared to the last scenario, Trotsky would be the one that starts off most of the shit. Starting poorly planned civil wars and invade countries as soon as they fail. This would start the Second World War. But when would it start? As soon as Hitler enters the scene, the USSR declares war in the pretense that Germany is a threat to the world's stability. The West, most Britain and France, join the Germans in their war against the Soviets. Germany, having basically no army, 
falls to the Russians, and the French stay in the Maginot Line. Plans are made to go around it, of course. Romania and Czechoslovakia fall to the Communists, and Hungary gets cooed, having the Communists take control and are giving lost territories of the old Austro-Hungarian Empire. Yugoslavia and Bulgaria worried that they would be next made a pact with Italy and Greece, together with Turkey, that if they would be invaded that they would stay together in the upcoming war. The USSR, after hearing this, stayed off from invading the Balkans to focus on France. The Soviets invade Belgium and start a hard war with the French, not going as fast as the Germans as they didn't develop Blitzkrieg. In the Far East, the Japanese see the Allies are distracted, and they launch an invasion of their colonies, and also invade China. France fall due to rising unrest and communist sympathizers taking control of the state. Paris falls to the revolutionaries and not to the Soviets, so France exits the war peacefully turning into a communist state. By peacefully I mean bloody and gruesome. The US is dragged into the war after the Japanese attack them, just like in our timeline. The Soviet Union, knowing that it secured Europe, launches an invasion of the Japanese territories in China, and together with the Americans they take out the Japanese Empire. Britain was left out of the peace treaty, and America was left with British and French colonies. British Malaya, Hong Kong, French Indochina are handed to the Americans. In Europe, Italy, Spain and Yugoslavia get cooed and fall to the communists. The British, seeing that a prolonged war with the Soviets might drag in the new French Commune, they sign a peace treaty with the Soviet Union. Trotsky wins the Second World War. Eventually the Americans and the Soviets would fight, either in a Cold War scenario or direct conflict. Who would win is down to can the US and its allies hold out long enough for the American industry to outproduce the Soviets, or will the Soviets, with the aid of its communist ally, invade, will invade the British, take over India, and lock away the world from the Americans? That is up for you to decide. Trotsky would believe that he will take out the Americans, that it's just a matter of time not knowing that after his death the Soviet Union would be left with a long stare at the Americans, never in reach but never far enough away that they feel safe. Ah, oh, and that concludes the last fucking part of this fucking series. Pichko Mater. Hello! It's Omesh, in the flesh. Some of you have probably never seen me, how I look, or act, in a, quite some time. I think the first time I had a face reveal, it was like two years ago. Thank you for watching the video. About 30 minutes long, actually it's uh, 40 now. Thank you for uh, helping me reach 4,000 subscribers. I'm planning to reach 10k by... The end of this year, but I've been telling myself that ever since 2018, but hey, I never lose hope, even though my upload schedule is almost once a year. Yeah, the second video that I made, part two, took me about uh, 10 months to make. This one took me one year and uh, three days. Yeah, my I'm gonna branch out and make other types of videos. One of the videos that I'm planning to make is a superhero series about uh, different types of superpowers. Now, me and my series and how long they last. I'm not gonna make it like, oh, of course I need to make part one, then part two, then part three. It's gonna be a series where I just explore different types of powers whenever I want to. So, for example, pyrokinesis or super strength or telekinesis. I'll probably do them the first and then 
afterwards when people ask me to do more of those types of videos i'll continue making them other than that i need to thank you a lot for watching again like the video share it i have a patreon now and i also have a instagram you can also message me directly you can message me on instagram i'll be more active there anyways i hope you guys have a wonderful day this is omish signing out and now hit that music <laughs>